Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Professor Keegan, and I'm back with a video lecture for our material for Tuesday's class this week. Uh, this is a class in, uh, on United in Anger, um, a documentary um, recording the history of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And this is our first day on uh, content covering the AIDS crisis era. Um, in this unit, we'll be looking at um, uh, stuff about ACT UP, but then also some documents that help us think about archives and the importance of recording queer history and the difficulty in accessing it. Um, thinking about the experience of generational crisis and trauma that the AIDS crisis was uh, alongside the problem of historical erasure and loss of history. Um, so we'll be moving through material covering from about 1980 to the mid-90s in this section, up until maybe 9-11 in 2001, actually. Um, so uh, this is a short unit, and then we'll be ending um, the semester looking at Sarah Shulman's The Gentrification of the Mind. Um, so uh, just a few reminders um, for you. We are moving to remote uh, co uh, contact, <laughs> unfortunately, for the rest of the semester. Um, so I'm going to be pushing reminders to you at the beginning of each video, as well as through email and Slack. Um, so I just thought I'd go through these really quickly. Um, first of all, please submit work as you can. I'm aware that we're not all on the same schedule anymore. A lot of you are probably doing um, elder care or working extra hours or looking for jobs um, or, or babysitting or doing whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, deadlines are going to be really flexible as long as we kind of get everything in by the last day of the semester, um, that would be fine. Um, however, I would ask to keep in mind that discussion entries are going to be our highest priority for on-time submission. Um, commenting can come later if need be, uh, but it's really only a core group of about seven or eight of you each course session that needs to do this work for the rest of us to generate the conversations we're going to be having. So please do prioritize um, covering the material and then writing discussion entries if you're assigned one. And that will really help keep us on track and preserve the backbone of the course. Um, secondarily, uh, you might have noticed if you haven't turned something in um, and I've uh, Blackboard has designed you a zero for that work, um, I am emailing you not to worry about that. Um, simply just get the work to me via email when you can, and I'll go into Blackboard and overwrite your score. Um, those zeros are really just me trying to keep up with my own grading load. Um, so every time I enter one, I send a little message to you saying, if you end up doing this, just send it to me and don't freak out because that zero doesn't really represent your score. It's just a placeholder until I can actually input a value. Um, so do not worry about that. Just um, make sure to get the work to me as soon as you can. Um, also, I'm aware that some of you may not have been able to grab your copy of Stryker's Transgender History before you left campus, or maybe you don't have access to it where you are. Um, so I have actually accessed an electronic copy and I've loaded the chapter for Thursday's class this week into Blackboard for you. So all you have to do is, if you don't have the book, is go there to find the reading. Um, and lastly, please do reach out to me with questions, issues, technical problems. Um, I am here for you and here to support you getting through the course. Um, I'm available via email, Slack, and textable um, if you have my number, which I pushed to all of you last week. Um, so with all those reminders in mind, let's talk a bit about the content for today, which was, was um, United in Anger, an oral history of ACT UP. Um, this is a documentary covering the key actions of ACT UP from its formation through to its later victories um, in the kind of tail end of the crisis period of the AIDS epidemic. Um, we still have an AIDS epidemic. Um, many, many people die of AIDS every year uh, globally, um, but the AIDS crisis is dated from about 1980 to 1996, um, defined as a period of crisis where the U.S. government um, uh, was not taking adequate steps to get the uh, pandemic under control. And um, 96 was when the uh, viral cocktail was developed that slowed people from dying of the disease. 
Um, so this documentary covers those key kind of 16 years of the crisis. And I was um, <laughs> thinking that this is um, oddly appropriate material for our current moment where we are also going through a, pan a viral pandemic and we also are seeing that <laughs> lessons really have not been learned. Um, the US government is not that much more prepared for this happening than they were um, when I was a kid. So that can be kind of instructive thinking about connections here. So uh, this is unit five on the AIDS crisis. And uh, this is an image of one of ACT UP's many actions. This is the uh, 20th anniversary uh, die-in that they did in 2007 to commemorate um, their 20th anniversary of fund, uh, being founded. Um, and a die-in is where a lot of people lie down as if they're dead um, to kind of literalize the actual losses of the crisis. So um, a lot of you probably haven't studied the AIDS crisis at all. It's not something that's usually covered in K through 12 history courses. Um, and we've been talking about the kind of pendulum style um, movement that we see in US history around LGBTQ issues where there will be some progress and then a, a swing back and then some progress and then a swing back. And the, the 1980s were definitely a swing back. Um, so we have, we're coming from the height of the sort of liberation moment. All these groups are writing manifestos, they're creating uh, political collectives, the, the pride parades have begun. Um, and then almost just as quickly, within just a 10 year period, suddenly there's the emergence of this virus. Um, now, HIV has actually, actually been documented in the human population before 1980, um, but this was really when it kind of turned into an outbreak. Um, and so, it, it emerged in 1980 in a number of vulnerable um, social populations. So I, IV drug users, uh, immigrant communities, especially Haitian immigrants, hemophiliacs who were getting high numbers of blood transfusions, and then also gay men and trans people um, who were both having um, anal sex. Um, and it's so more easily transmitted through anal sex. And so, and people didn't realize that it could be communicated that way for a while. So these groups were getting, were just like places where the outbreak began and they were all kind of also socially stigmatized people in one way or another. And so we see this problem where when infectious disease starts to be present in a population that's considered socially undesirable, the government is sometimes less uh, willing to take action because those populations are viewed as you know, already kind of less desirable people. We don't want to spend money on them. They're not taxpayers. They're not voters. They're not my voters. Um, so there's this idea that the people who are being affected aren't really that valuable. Um, in fact, it really was just the one group, hemophiliacs, who were seen as, as sort of innocent victims of the, of the virus. And those people were really elevated in the media as examples of why we should take action. Um, so what happened was 1980 is an interesting year because we, ha we have the Reagan administration coming in um, with, with massive victories. Um, we have this disease starting to rear its head uh, and the combination of that plus the, the rising sort of homophobic pressure from the religious right, which we looked at with Outrage 69 in the late 70s, we already have a string of arsons targeting LGBTQ spaces, bars, and community centers all over the country in the late 70s, um, these things start to cohere. And what happens is that they sort of weave into this kind of cultural backlash against, homo uh, against gay and trans people um, at this time. Um, and HIV really did reactivate those older ideas of queer and trans people as sick that we talked about that were quite prevalent from the 30s through the 50s and really became sort of national policy in the 1950s. Um, though a lot of those associations come back to life in the 1980s with the prevalence of HIV among particularly gay men. Um, and then those attitudes begin to blend with new anti-queer and trans attitudes that are being promoted by this emerging conservative right wing of religious 
uh, sort of affiliates that's forming in the country, people who really did back and, and help put Reagan in office. Um, and so you can see some of the, the thinking that was common at the time. This is from the Moral Majority's newsletter, um, AIDS, Homosexual Diseases Threaten American Families. Um, there is so much going on here about who counts as American <laughs> and who doesn't. Um, gay people were kind of characterized as not even being American, not even really human, and something that the entire nation needed to be protected against, and certainly young, white, straight children needed to be protected against. So we see how the, it becomes the queers versus the American family. Um, and this kind of thinking was really, really common. Uh, in the early to mid 80s. Um, the epidemic as it began to explode went largely unaddressed by the Reagan administration. Now this is something that um, Outrage 69, or I'm sorry, um, United in Anger covers pretty well. But I wanted to also show you this uh, segment of a sh uh, short segment of a film called When AIDS Was Funny. Um, that was made um, to document how the press briefings in the Reagan administration sounded at this time. Um, so I'm just going to play you this. It's about eight minutes. And you'll get the idea of how people were actually treating the crisis. So I don't think there's been, no, been no personal experience here, Lester. No, I mean, I thought you were keeping Doctor, I checked thoroughly with Dr. Ruge this morning, and he's had no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no patients <laughs> suffered from AIDS or whatever it is. doesn't have gay plague. Is that what you're saying? Or what? No, didn't say that. Didn't say that. I thought I heard you on the State Department over there. Why don't you stay over there? <laughs> Because I love you, Larry. Oh, I that's see. Fun. Well, I, let's don't put it in those terms, Lester. <laughs> oh, I retract that. I hope so. Not true, and this one's true. Lester's ears perked up when you said fairies. <laughs> There's an abiding interest in that. This is the movement in Denver at the Comics and Mayors Convention. Press for federal assistance, uh, getting at the deeds from all the The president has been involved in, um, in, in, in briefed on the AIDS situation a number of months ago in a cabinet meeting, and ordered that high priority be given to research matters on it. Uh, the Center for Disease Control has been involved for some time. The president will continue to be updated. We have recently asked that $12 million uh, be reprogrammed for research on AIDS. That's the extent of the president's involvement, which has been... Larry, does the president think that it might help if he suggested that the gays uh, cut down on their cruising? <laughs> I told you. I didn't hear your answer, Larry. Uh, 
I just was acknowledging your, you acknowledging your interest in this subject. You don't think that it would help if the gains cut down on their cruising? It we're, would help we're, re we're researching it. If we come up with any, any, uh, any research that uh, shed some light on whether gays should cruise or not cruise, we'll make it available to you. <laughs> Lester's beginning to circle now, he's moving in front. <laughs> Go ahead. It's the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. Oh, an estimated. Look, can I ask a question, Mark? You were close. An estimated 300,000 people have been exposed to AIDS, which can be transmitted through saliva. Will the president, as commander in chief, take steps to protect armed forces with medical services from um, AIDS patients or those who run the risk of spreading AIDS? And in the same manner that they forbid typhoid fever people from uh, being involved in the health or food services. Or well, is, that, is the president concerned about this subject, Larry? That I have seems to have expressed so much concern. Here? reaction here, I, you know, I have it isn't only the jocks, Lester. Has he sworn off water faucets? No, but I mean, is he going to do anything, Larry? It, Lester, I have not heard him express anything. I'm sorry. He has no, uh, no, express no opinion about this epidemic? No, but I must confess I haven't asked him about it. Would you ask him, Larry? Go back into have you been checked? President going to well, I, about I didn't hear the answer. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's hard work. I don't get paid enough. Uh, uh, is there anything else we need to do here? Okay, so um, if you want to watch the rest of this, you can look this up on YouTube. It's called When AIDS Was Funny. You get the sense of how these press briefings sounded, yes? Like, um, there's not just the complete lack of actual doing anything, addressing the crisis at all, presenting any kind of fact facts to the press about it but also the press pool itself is like just like thinks it's really funny to be talking about gay stuff right um so you can hear both the government in action and also the sort of callousness of the general population or the culture uh, and how those two things together really did combine to produce like a, like a massive crisis um in fact i think toward the end here they show the number of uh, deaths in the U.S. as of 2015, which is, you know, 658,000, almost uh, 659,000 people have died um, of this infection, um, which could have been much better managed uh, if the government had done really anything in the first six, seven, eight years of this problem. Um, so uh, you get the idea of how this kind of thinking was, um, if not obviously endorsed by the administration, at least permitted, allowed, um, and um, AIDS activists were not making any headway with getting actual information about the disease. In fact, HIV cannot be spread through saliva. That's just not true, right? So you can see how people didn't have accurate information at the time. Okay, um, so uh, what happens in this period, and we're going to be talking more about this when we get to Shulman, uh, is a real divide in the community around political strategy in response to the crisis. Um, so we've looked at ACT UP, and they were kind of one part of this half of a set of groups, um, also uh, Queer Nation, WAM, other groups like that. Um, that focused on forcing the government and healthcare agencies uh, to do something through direct disruptive action. So we saw in the film ACT UP do things like die-ins, kiss-ins, media zaps, um, political funerals, uh, shutting down the New York uh, Stock Exchange, shutting down um, Grand Central Station, um, you know, protesting um, 
agencies like the CDC, um, protesting private people's homes, like senators' homes who are blocking AIDS funding, right? So we see really direct disruptive kinds of militant um, action on the part of those groups. So for example, um, when we think about the Ashes action, which is uh, represented in um, United in Anger, this is a flyer for the Ashes action. Um, that was a, maybe about as direct as you can get, like using using the actual ashes of, of people who'd passed from the disease as a kind of political weapon against, um, it would have been George Bush, right, at this time in the early 90s. Um, whereas there were other groups like Gay Men's Health Crisis, um, the Names Project, which is famous for the AIDS, making the AIDS memorial quilt. These groups adopted a more kind of uh, moderate approach, uh, focusing on fundraising, crisis counseling, healthcare, and also mourning those who had died. Um, so these are kind of two wings uh, of different political strategies in response to what was really an extinction level crisis in the community. Um, and it really does, as a split, reflect earlier divisions in the community. Um, we think about how some kind of more gay moderates had broken away from GLF to form GAA right after Stonewall, right? Those kinds of moves where we see the more radical group and the kind of more moderate group working on the same problem, with, but with different sets of strategies. Um, and that's actually covered in this video that I, um, is also some of this is also included in the documentary, uh, but I wanted to show you this. This is from um, it's AIDS Community Television, which was a uh, lot. They were basically like video reels produced by uh, Diva TV, which was an affinity group within ACT UP um, that filmed most of ACT UP's protests. So here you can see activists talking about why they specifically thought that the um, AIDS memorial quilt was an insufficient response. Last April, my lover Warren. <laughs> Last April, my lover Warren died, and um, I was going to send his ashes to George Bush with a protest letter. And um, I talked with friends from New York, who I, I felt like that was going to be real private, you know, like no one would know about it. And they suggested bringing it to the floor of ACT UP. They said they would personally support it. So they said, you know, when you're in New York, why don't you bring it to the group? So I, I presented it as. Um, a next step in the activism, um, I mean, lots of people have been talking about if they die, having their bodies used in a political funeral. And I know there are people out there now who, who have AIDS, who have made arrangements for their, if they die of AIDS, for their bodies to be used, <clears throat> excuse me, for their bodies to be used in some sort of political way, whether it's a political funeral being, you know, in a coffin with, being carried to the streets or thrown over the White House fence or left in their 
particular city on the steps of their city hall or brought to their senator's office. Um, people are making these arrangements now. At this stage, there, there may be as many as 15 um, people who are bringing ashes of people they love to die to babies to be deposited there, and then there are going to be hundreds of other people marching with us, uh, helping us the best they can to actually get to the White House lawn. And then others just marching in support. So that's the, um, the reason we're here this weekend. Also, what we chose this weekend because the, uh, the quilt, the Named Project quilt, is, is here this weekend. And I specifically wanted there to be a counterpoint to uh, the quilt's approach to bringing home what's happening with AIDS. I think the quilt itself does good stuff and is moving. Still, it's like making something beautiful out of the epidemic. And I felt like doing something like this is a way of showing there's nothing beautiful about it. You know, this is what I'm left with. I've got a, a box full of ashes and bone chips. You know, there's no beauty in that. Um, and I, I felt like a statement like this, throwing these on the White House lawn, is like saying, this is what George Bush has done, you know? This is what him and Ronald Reagan Quorum have done. Bring the dead to your door! We won't take it anymore! Bring the dead to your door! We won't take it anymore! Bring the dead to your door! We won't take it anymore! Bring the dead to your door! Okay, so you can see how ACT UP was thinking of the Ashes action as a response to the Names Quilt um, and how they objected to it because it was too passive. And, you know, the people who came up with the idea for the Names Project and the AIDS Quilt were using the language of Middle America, the symbolic language of the quilt, which is a traditional American handicraft, to try to make a kind of symbolic argument for queer people as part of the fabric of America, part of the fabric of the heartland. Um, and ACT UP thought of that as a pretty assimilationist kind of style of um, imagery. And they wanted to do something with their anger. They wanted to do something with the actual damage. They wanted to make the damage more um, perceivable in a way that they saw as politicized versus religious. Um, and so we can, you know, really see how these groups were using 
different kind of political strategies. And that really does kind of feed into the kind of politics we li are living through today in terms of kind of who ended up in kind of in charge of the major uh, LGBTQ political organizations at the end of the crisis and whose politics had been pushed further out to the margins. Um, so, and we'll talk about this more when we get to Shulman because she includes an interview with um, Andrew Sullivan in her book. But um, by the end of the crisis, and remember it's not the end of the epidemic, it's just the end of the political crisis around AIDS, um, what we see is an emerging split between on one side, this new kind of gay conservatism, we might call it, that starts sort of starting to kind of emerge from the crisis and look around and say, hey, we made it through this thing. Let's just uh, get rid of kind of formal legal discrimination against gay men and lesbians and call it a day, right? So in 1994, um, gay writer Andrew Sullivan published this um, really highly read essay in the New Republic uh, called The Politics of Homosexuality, in which he made the case for a new kind of post-AIDS conservative gay politics. Um, this is Sullivan. Um, and in this piece, he argued that the new gay agenda post-AIDS crisis should focus solely on eliminating state discrimination against lesbians and gay men, and he particularly po um, points out same-sex marriage and military service as two things he thinks the movement should focus on. Um, and he said that um, the more subversive aims of gay liberation, which had argued for a much wider field of political struggle, we talked about anti-poverty, anti-violence, anti-capitalism, right, um, alliances with other kinds of radical groups, the ending of marriage as a sort of a, a oppressive institution. Um, all of those things, he says, are way too subversive, and we should focus really narrowly on these inclusion in these two um, institutions, the military and marriage. And um, then in uh, 94 or 95, he puts out a book called Virtually Normal, in which he argues that once those two goals, marriage and military inclusion, were achieved, we should, quote, have a party and close down the gay root rights movement for good, right? So he's like, Th those are the only two things we need. Um, forget about bisexual or trans issues, right? Those are not pertinent to gay people. Um, just get these two um, inclusions into these two institutions, and that's all we should go for. Um, this probably sounds a bit like the GAA um, platform, if you think about it, right? Where they were like, we're only dealing with gay issues. Nothing else matters to us. We just want these narrow kind of wedge, wedge legal issues resolved. Um, so you might be wondering, like, where did all this focus on gay marriage come from if gay activists in the liberation period weren't even settled on it as a goal? Well, a bunch of people who survived the AIDS crisis... Um, uh, kind of ended up thinking, well, that was so traumatizing and such such a uh, polarizing time, maybe we just need to focus on this more conservative goal. Um, however, that's not the only viewpoint. So it, it is the emerging dominant viewpoint uh, in the sort of, in the gay community, but there's also um, a sort of still liberation-minded uh response or wing of people who don't agree with those politics. And so uh, really famously, uh, gay playwright Tony Kushner, who's the author of Angels in America, as well as a number of other works, um, he was very famous in the early 90s for writing Angels in America, which is a play about the AIDS crisis. And in 94, he responds directly to Sullivan in, in the newspaper The Nation in a piece called The Socialism of the Skin. And in that piece, he warned against ass the prioritizing assimilation as politics too much and tried to remind his readership of the larger aims of gay liberation and its radical history. And in that piece, he argued against Sullivan's pragmatism, saying, quote, it's entirely conceivable that we will one day live miserably in a thoroughly ravaged world in which lesbians and gay men can marry and serve openly in the military, and that's it, unquote. Um, and so he was really questioning, you know, you know, marriage and military service aren't linked to these other um, more liberation-minded uh, aims. 
that would benefit more people than just kind of like white middle class gay men and lesbians. And he goes on in the piece to point out that things like poverty, militarism, environmental destruction, consumerism, violence, these are all things that gay liberation activists cared about and wanted to, to end. Um, he said, we're key to the successful functioning of the free market or capitalism, but homophobia is not. The system could certainly accommodate demands for equal rights for homosexuals without danger to itself. So Kushner is saying basically there's nothing about gay identity that makes it antithetical to like these more conservative politics and that we, we really need to be careful because it would be very easy for gay men and, and lesbians to get kind of seduced into um, a politics that oppresses other queer people, people who are not cisgender, people who are not white, people who are not middle class, right? So Kushner kind of pushing back here and saying, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget who are your real allies should be. Um, and this is a debate that kind of raged all the way up to when uh, gay marriage uh, was legalized by the Supreme Court in 19, uh, or, I'm sorry, in 2015. And um, the debate was revisited by Richard Kim in The Nation, um, the same magazine that Kushner's piece was published in, uh, in April of 2014. And Richard Kim writes, uh, 20 years later, it is undeniable that Sullivan's brand of politics now defines the gay movement and that the achievement of its limited goals is on the near horizon. So he's saying like, it's clear that Sullivan won the argument because here we are about to legalize gay marriage and what has really happened to all of our other priorities. And then he went on to say, meanwhile, the dystopian telos or end point, right? That Kushner presciently warned us of is here and now, unquote. So he's saying like Kushner was warning about, about consumerism and environmental degradation and violence and poverty and all these things that we took our eye we took our eyes off of in order to get this one thing. Um, and so what is that, where does that leave us? Um, and I, so, so I think those are great questions to be considering um, as we head toward Shulman. Um, I'm going to ask you to travel over to discussions now. Actually, I meant to write in here to go over to discussions um, and uh, kind of respond to a prompt I've prepared for you in relationship to this uh, video lecture. So I'll leave it here. Um, send me some thoughts on uh, discussions on Blackboard and I'll talk to you later.